welcome to Physical Geography 100 Lecture Podcast Series. I am your instructor, Brian Krause, and today we're going to be discussing mechanical and chemical weathering. As all many lectures, I'm not going to cover all topics or ideas presented in your textbook. Rather, my aim is to highlight a few key ideas and discuss them in a bit more detail. So on that note, let's jump into the lecture. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to compare and contrast the differences between mechanical and chemical weathering. So today we're going to be talking about the different types of weathering. When you talk about weathering, you first need to know the difference between erosion and weathering. So when talking about weathering, it's the actual breakup of rock into smaller pieces called fragments. And sometimes those fragments can be called sediments. And once those sediments have been created, they can be transported to another location through the process that we call erosion. So in this lecture podcast, we're going to be focusing on the change of rock due to mechanical, chemical, or biotic. However, it is important to note that these processes often act together. When discussing agents of weathering, there are several that you should be familiar with. Most weathering agents are atmospheric, so from a chemical weathering perspective, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor are the three most important. Temperature changes are also an important weathering agent, as well as water, which can penetrate down into the rocks. And we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in the coming up slides. So mechanical or physical weathering is the actual breakup of rock. It's going to change the size and shape of this rock. So there is absolutely no chemical or biotic change occurring with the rock. So this figure illustrates uh, mechanical weathering, where a large rock, shown here on the left, is physically broken into smaller pieces of rock. In doing so, physical weathering makes it easier uh, for surface materials to chemically decompose and be eroded. So when a large block of material is broken into smaller pieces, additional surface area for chemical weathering is able to be, is able to act on that exposed rock. So there are four types of mechanical weathering uh, we're going to look at in the coming slides. There's frost wedging, salt wedging, temperature change, and exfoliation. Frost wedging is probably the most important single agent of uh, mechanical weathering, which is the freeze-thaw action of water. So water works its way into cracks of the rock, and it freezes and it expands when it freezes. As it expands, it makes the cracks a little bit bigger and bigger, and eventually the rock is going to break apart. So here in this figure, we can see on the left that water has gotten into a crack in the rock. It's just froze and has expanded. Now over time, the rock will eventually break apart, as shown on the picture on the right. Now because the rock is split, it has more surface area for further uh, mechanical weathering. However, recall from earlier that mechanical and chemical weathering often work together. So now that there is more surface area space due to the rock splitting, there's also more surface area for chemical weathering uh, to occur. So another form of mechanical weathering is something called salt wedging, which occurs when salts crystallize out of solution from water vapor. So some sources of this salt water vapor include sea spray and splash and fog. So when water vapor evaporates off this rock, the salts are left behind as these tiny little crystals. Over time, these crystals are going to grow, and as they grow, they're going to pry apart the rock grain by grain. So here is a picture uh, showing salt wedging, and we can see where the salt wedging has created many of these tiny holes in the rock. Also, we can see the salt residue being left behind as this white stuff that's on this rock. So if you see a rock that looks like this, it's a good indication that salt wedging is occurring. So temperature change that is not accompanied by freeze-thaw cycles also contributes to mechanical weather. Here in this process, rocks heat up and cool down. And this change in temperature causes the rocks to expand and contract. And so this process tends to occur more in dark colored grains than light colored grains because dark grains absorb more energy, so they will expand more. So as this occurs over and over, the rock weakens and finally it will break apart into smaller little pieces. Now, this type of mechanical weathering occurs in arid and mountain summits where extreme diurnal temperature changes occur. So this picture is a great example 
of this weathering process where we can see this rock has broken up into lots of different pieces because of this change in temperature of going from very hot to very cold. So the last type of mechanical weather we'll look at is exfoliation. And exfoliation generally occurs in granite and related intrusive rocks. In exfoliation, rocks weather by peeling off in these curved sheets rather than grain by grain as we just looked at. The thickness of these sheets can range from a few millimeters to several meters in thickness. While the dynamics of exfoliation are not fully understood, it's believed that rocks which form under the surface form under a great amount of pressure. And when this pressure is released from the overlying weight through tectonics, isostasy, or erosion, the rocks crack in a process called unloading. As the rocks expand, the outer layer breaks free in these sheets called exfoliation. So here's an example of exfoliation in Yosemite National Park. And notice the sheets of rock that have been exfoliated, the very big chunks that are peeling off. Now let's turn our attention to chemical weathering. With chemical weathering, there is a change in the composition of rock. So there are three ways in which this can happen. Oxidization, carbonation, and hydrolysis. So a good place to see these effects of chemical weathering is a graveyard if you look at the headstones. So it's easy to see uh, a rock that is resistant to weather and, is, and one that's going to be less resistant to weather. If the leathering and numbers and the headstone are faded and disappearing, you probably have a soft rock. And if the numbers and uh, letters are clearly legible, you have a relatively uh, resistant rock to weathering. And this is kind of, you can see here on the left, uh, the rock is pretty resistant, and on the right, it's being uh, chemically uh, weathered. So the name of the type of weathering we're going to talk about gives you a clue about what attacks the rock itself. So in oxidization, oxygen combines with minerals and elements in the rock and forms a new product that is a red rust color in the rock. The reason for this is the iron in the rock reacts with the oxygen and iron oxide is produced, which causes this red rust color. So here is an image from the Badlands in Ontario. This is an iron rich uh, rock that has this iron oxide that is produced uh, in this red rust color, which is a magnificent color. So this is a oxidization occurring in these rocks. So the next type of chemical weathering is something called carbonation. And this is the reaction between the carbon dioxide in the water and carbonate rocks. Specifically, there is a mineral, calcite, that reacts with the carbon dioxide. So what happens here is you tend to get carbonic acid. So how this works is that Carbon dioxide dissolves into water and creates a very weak acid called carbonic acid that attacks the calcite in limestone and marble. So given enough time, that rocks get eaten away and it creates caves or sinkholes. So here is a cave system that was created by this weathering process and what it would look like. And here is what a sinkhole looks like from carbonation. So what happens here is that the underlying rock can no longer support the overlying soil layer and just becomes too heavy and then just kind of caves in you know, on itself and creates these uh, gigantic sinkholes. Quickly, let's turn our attention to some features about caves. So a lot of times, caves are under the water table. So some of that water will drip through the joints of the ceiling. So if that water contains enough calcite, that water will evaporate off the ceiling and create a structure called a stalactite over millions of years. So if that drip is big enough and falls to the surface floor, what happens now is that structure grows from the floor and that is called a stalagmite. And if they meet up with each other, they are called a column. So here's an image that shows all these features together, stalactite, stalagmites, and columns. So as a kid, I went to a Penn's Cave in Pennsylvania which is America's only all-water limestone cavern. And they give you these long tours in these boats that are about 45, 50 minutes to go through. And you can see all these different types of stalactites and stalagmites. Uh, and it's quite impressive. So if you ever get to central Pennsylvania, I encourage you to check out Penn's Cavern.
The final type of chemical weathering that we're going to look at is hydrolysis. And hydrolysis is the chemical union of water with another mineral or element in the rock. And it leads to a change in the structure of that rock. So what happens is that in terms of a very hard mineral in the much softer, weaker substance. An example of this is feldspar would be attacked by water in the hydrolysis process, and it would create a very weak clay. Realize that chemical weathering generally occurs in only certain areas. So some areas are going to be more prominent than others. Climate is going to have a major impact in terms of the type of chemical weathering you're dealing with. The majority of chemical weathering takes place in the tropics simply because of the hot temperatures and there's lots and lots of moisture. So these kind of elements uh, promote chemical. Biological weathering is where living organisms, plants, and animals contribute to the weathering process. So one of the more notable examples is when a plant root uh, grows into a crack, which over time is going to kind of widen this crack as the, as the root gets bigger or longer. Another example is lichen that grows on rocks, and it's going to draw minerals from the rocks by this ion exchange. And this leaching can weaken the rock over time as well. Finally, burrowing animals kind of mix the soil, which uh, can lead to rocks being uh, disintegrated. So on that note, this concludes the lecture podcast on weathering. Have a great day.